Alright, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to Unit 2, Area Study 2, Equity and Efficiency for VC Economics. We're back learning remotely, so we're going to have all these videos coming out, out, hopefully, as soon as I can get them out. So we've got the whole topic there for you to be able to go through at your own pace and learn. Um, with this topic, we're going to be starting out mainly with the equity stuff and then getting to efficiency later on in the topic and kind of seeing how they interact. We'll learn about them individually first, just because it's a little bit easier that way. But what we're going to do is on this first slide, look at the key knowledge that we'll be looking at today. So this is everything that we're going to learn in this topic. I also highly recommend, no matter where you're a student, this is just from the VCAR study design. Underneath this, it lists key skills. A really, really pro tip for any kind of VCE subject is although you need to know all of the key knowledge, the key skills is how the questions are going to be asked. And you can get a lot of the task words or command words there that are going to come up in stack questions that you can then prepare yourself to really know what questions are going to be asked. You can kind of predict it and then get them correct very quickly. Um, but this is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, income as well as wealth, the difference between them, different types of income, everyone likes income. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about the difference between equity and equality because they are different. Um, and the differences are pretty simple. So we'll get to that towards the end. So let's get straight into the first thing to talk about. So we're going to be talking about income and wealth. So what is income? Well, most people gain an income from selling their resources to the business sector. For an example of this, technically I'm selling my resources of being a teacher, my knowledge of economics and other subjects to the government and providing it to you. And then they give me an income for that. And I like getting an income for that. So that's how I get an income, other people. So say, if you work at KFC, you sell your labor so you can cook some chicken, then they give you an income for that. It's what you get for selling your um, resources. It's not just labor resources. There's a bit more to it than that. Other ways people can gain an income is through things like if they own property, they can get rent as an income. If you have shares, you can get dividends as an income. If you have a lot of savings, you can get interest as an income. There are a few different other methods that people can gain income, but the most common method is through selling your labor resources. So some different kinds of income that we're going to talk about. So first up, we've got earned income, which comes from selling your labor. It's what you earn, you work for it and you get it. And then we've got unearned income, which includes things like rent and interest that we just talked about and is received by allowing others to use your property and savings. And together these are known as a factor income because they come from they become a part of your whole income. Then we have a transfer income, which is when it's basically a lot of the time we kind of call it welfare. Uh, transfer income is the official name because it's what the government's transferring to people with the expectation of nothing in return. And it's derived from government cash welfare payments made to the neediest individuals with little or no income and wealth. So these are massive at the moment. Um, transfer incomes or welfare spending is the largest portion of government spending in general. It's where the majority of our tax money goes. Um, but these are, especially in the current economy, these are massively important through the job seeker and the job keeper kind of payments that are existing and the changes amongst them. It's massively important now. It's going to be massively important in year 12 next year when you have to learn about more detail into all these things in government budgetary policy. Um, then lastly, we've got fringe benefits, which are special non-monetary rewards given by an employer to selected employees in lieu of income. So for example, some workplaces, rather than giving you a pay raise, might give you a company car, or they might give you a um, company phone, or like, um, other things like in, in teaching, because we need a laptop for teaching. Technically, they give us a laptop. Yeah, look at that. Like, what am I recording this on if my laptop is there? Um, so these kind of things are benefits. They um, are beneficial for you. So like my laptop is a fringe benefit because I don't just use it for teaching. Sometimes I use it for online shopping. Sometimes I use it for social media. Sometimes I use it for booking in like classes. Sometimes I'd like to be able to use it for booking in flights, but at the moment, not really an option, but that is a fringe benefit, non-monetary um, reward given to you uh, in lieu of more income. Although I would like the more income. So some classifications of our income. So those are types of income, and now we move on to classifications of it. So how different ways income can be classified. So when you receive it, different ways that we look at it. So income can be classified 
to the extent that it is manipulated by the government. And how does the government manipulate our income? Well, by taking tax out. So that's a major part of it. So first we've got our private or market income, which is income that is received by contributing to the production process. So your salaries, your interest, or your dividends, you get your earned and your unearned income, just the total um, amount. Then we've got gross income, which is your private income plus any direct cash benefits from the government, such as pensions, family tax benefits, any welfare payments, anything extra that you're getting on top. And then your disposable income, which is your gross income, less taxes levied from the government. So the majority of people pay about 30 to 35% of their income in tax. Um, I'm sure any of you that have worked long enough in your casual or part-time jobs, or full-time jobs if you're an adult watching this, um, you look at your pay slip and you look at the tax amount and you're just like, oh God, that is, that is depressing. But um, that tax money is obviously very important to go towards stimulating the economy and through many other methods, as hopefully as an economic student, you appreciate. Some other classifications of our income, we've got a social wage income. So that's your disposable income plus indirect government benefits provided in the form of goods and services. So health, education, welfare, it's when um, they kind of add on the extra benefits you're getting that could potentially cost you more money. So things like if you're getting public education, a private education would cost a lot more. So technically you're doing a little bit better off by the fact you don't have to pay as much for public education because the government provides that to you. Or if you go to the hospital and you just go through public health care, it's not going to cost you anything. Um, so you're kind of getting benefits for that and that gets added on top. And then your final income, which is your social wage, less any indirect taxes. So indirect taxes are things that you pay taxes on goods and services. So things like GST, excise taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, petrol, etc. Um, so any extra taxes you pay on the goods and services that you uh, purchase. And then lastly, we've got equivalized household income, which is your disposable income adjusted to take into account the size and composition of households. So for example, um, my household, there's two adults who work and there is a eight month old baby who understandably doesn't work. And so to work out our equivalent household income, they look at how many people are working, how many people are in the household and adjust it to equivalize it because our income together is very different to if it was a family of eight, because if they earn the same as what we did, it's gonna stretch a lot less far. Um, or if one of us was on our own and we earned what we earned, it would stretch a lot further because you're just one person trying to be satisfied by that income. So that's how equivalent household income works. It just adjusts it to make the size and composition equal across different fields. So then we look at the nature of wealth. Um, bonus points for if you know where this image is from, it is a pile of money from Breaking Bad. Um, so wealth consists of assets or things of value owned by private individuals and or governments. So wealth are basically um, physical things that you have, uh, not always physical, but things that can potentially earn you money that have value. So for most individuals, wealth takes a long time to accumulate and for very lucky people, it can be inherited. I'm very jealous of those people. But especially in this day and age, a lot of people are struggling to gain wealth. Like the majority of wealth in Australia is owned by older um, demographics. So the larger, the older age groups. And that's because now, so things like people aren't buying houses as often because they're so expensive um, and they can't actually get a house deposit together. So people end up paying rent and then never actually accumulating that wealth. So um, and people aren't buying cars, etc. It's just what you physically have or anything you have that has worth. So the average household wealth in Australia is about a million dollars. Um, so if you looked around what your house value is and everything that's within it and what people have in shares, um, savings, etc. It's on average about that, which um, when you think about the average house price in Victoria, I think is about in the 700,000s. People don't have a lot extra. A lot of people don't own a house in the first place. So wealth is great because you can use it to earn income and it can benefit you later on in life. Some people gain wealth very quickly and then they can live off the income that that wealth earns for the rest of their life. And that's pretty amazing. And then we look at nominal income versus real income. So as you hopefully remember from previous topics that we've studied, the word real in economics always means taking out the effects of inflation. Because if we looked at income over time, income is gonna rise because prices are rising. And if income doesn't rise at the same rate as prices, 
we're going to be earning less by comparison and we won't be able to maximize our living standards. Our living standards will get worse because we are getting less goods and services with the money that we have. So um, in this example, so if you received a 5% pay rise one year, but the inflation rate was 6%, are your living standards better or worse? Well, they're worse because things are more expensive and you can't afford as much of them. So in general, we kind of expect incomes to increase at the same or more of a rate than um, inflation. We, If you look at the um, wage increases over time, I think at the moment the um, wage has been increasing about 2.2% across the year and inflation has been well about on that now because of panic buying that pushed it up. But it just means that you can tell from that if people are actually better or worse off based on their income. So we take away the effects of inflation from income to give us a better idea of if incomes are increasing or not. And then the last thing we're going to look at is equity versus equality. So explaining the difference between equity and equality. I really like this image here for um, kind of explaining it overall. So equality is about everyone being treated exactly the same regardless of what their situation is, whereas equity is more about fairness. Equity is about having everyone be as fair as possible. So in that image, having the shortest person be get the same amount of boxes as everyone else, they're actually worse off because everyone's being treated the same. Whereas if you are to spread them out evenly so it's fair, everyone is better off. And so in economics, we are more caring about equity because we want things to be fairer overall. Equality, if you looked at equality in general in economics, that kind of denotes itself more to communism and opinions on com communism are not for this topic that is for a different subject potentially if you're doing like history um, but although we would like more equality equity is what we are trying to achieve more so because we want things to be more fair we don't want the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer but would like them to get closer together the reason why it's good that we don't have full equality is because if everyone was equal there'd be no motivation to um, strive to become more efficient or more productive or be innovative. So having some inequality means that people are driven to actually improve, which in a capitalistic economy works really well because people are profit driven. People want to maximize their incomes. They want to maximize their profits. They want to maximize their wealth. So by having that little small degree of inequality, people push to do the most they can to maximize their living standards. All right. That's the end of this video. So I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you for surviving all the way to the end of this video. Uh, next up, we'll start talking about different ways that poverty is measured and the difference between absolute and relative poverty. If you have any questions at all, feel free to send me an email. My email is in the description below. Um, other than that, I hope you have an excellent day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.